All right. Well, good evening. How's everybody doing? Good. All right. Well, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab them and turn to the book of Nehemiah chapter 5. And uh, we're also going to have communion tonight. So I like how the Bible says to, well, Ezra, right? He prepared his heart to seek the Lord. So let's do that. Um, let's pray. Father, thank you for this night. Uh, thank you. Every, every moment with you is special, Lord. And really, really, Lord, it... it it's just about being in your presence it, that's so amazing. And especially when we can come together as a, a church body to be in your presence, Lord. And you've given us that just as a, a bit of, or a token of, of heaven, Lord. Just a, a little, little slice of heaven for us to enjoy, Lord, here on earth. And we thank you for that. We thank you for your word and we thank you for your truth. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, how you impart the truth to us, Lord. We pray for revelation, Lord, that um, you would reveal these truths to us, just like you did to Peter when you, you said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven, Lord. So reveal your truth to us. And Lord, as we partake of communion, I, I pray for soft hearts, Lord. I pray that, that we would be just like your children, just coming to you, Lord, and, and looking to you that you would lead us and guide us into all truth. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, Nehemiah chapter 5. So, you just, you have to really get the fact of the stressing of the temple in the midst of the people. This gives us a, a way to see what the Christian life really is. As you look at the temple, how important that was for the nation of Israel, how important it was for David to build, how amazing it was that God allowed Solomon to build that, that temple. When the temple was in the center of Jerusalem, and the people were correctly oriented to the temple, meaning that they are worshipful. And when I say that, I mean that the people were in a right relationship with God. They were in a worshipful relationship with God. They were in a relationship where God was God. And they saw themselves as those who would be so privileged to be in, in a relationship with Him, in, in harmony and sync, that through all those sacrifices and cleansings and feasts, all the things that were, were given to them as ways to worship the Lord, it, it, was, it was just basically a, an explanation of what it means to be in a right relationship with God. And so we, we find that Jesus says that, that we are the temple of the living God. So the temple in the Old Testament was a way to help us understand now that for a Christian, God lives inside of us. We are the temple of the living God. That in itself to me is pretty amazing. If you read through John chapter... 15, John 14. So amazing scripture right in there. Some of my favorite section of scripture, John 14, 15, and 16. It's just, you know, a lot of this discussion about us being in Him and Him being in us. And, and just, just that idea of being in Christ. I mean, all that involves that if you're a Christian, that means you're in Christ. And all that's to say as we look at the Scripture tonight, it, it's really to get us to understand how to be in a right relationship with God. It also helps us to understand how we can get 
sort of disfragmented, disjointed, disoriented with our relationship with God. When that happens, as we see figuratively with the temple, we see then the things of worship sort of lay in ruins. And that's when we feel the effects of being out of fellowship with God. And so in the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah being the, the main figure here, we find a guy that because of his relationship with God, he couldn't be okay when the things of God were in ruins. As he is in Babylon serving King Nebuchadnezzar, he got word that the temple was built, but it, it just wasn't going well. That there, there was a distress among the people. In our scenario, the temple was built, but it was the walls around the city of Jerusalem that laid in ruins. And so, because those walls laid in ruins, that the enemy would come and sort of trespass in the area of worship. And that's why the people, even though the temple existed, the people were distressed. is because the enemy was allowed to cross into the area of worship. How does that relate to us? Well, that relates to us if first and foremost we, we see ourselves as Christians, we see the most important thing in our life is that we're rightly related to God, and that means that we're going to be worshipers of God. We live as worshipers. But then the enemy starts to come in. The things of the world start to trespass into our area of worship. There, there comes things in our life that start to encroach on our relationship with God, thus affecting our worship, even though the potential and possibility for worship is there. It's not happening because of the effectiveness of the enemy transgressing and trespassing into that area. And that, that's when we get distressed. That's when our life as a Christian becomes more a life of panic and stress and frustration and discouragement and worry than it does of worship. And so Nehemiah, he couldn't be okay knowing that there is distress in Jerusalem. And he knew it was because the walls were damaged. And he asked King Nebuchadnezzar after he prayed if he can go back and help. And he, he was allowed to do that. And so we left off last week in chapter 4 with King Neb or I'm sorry, with Nehemiah actually rebuilding the walls around the temple effectively. And here's the deal. Here's the thing. When we're about the Father's business, when we're about the things of God, that's when we're right. That's when things are right with us. The wall was halfway built, and yet there was all sort of opposition. So last week we looked at how to continue to build or to continue to be about God's business, even with all this opposition. And so we get into chapter 5, and we're going to learn how to deal with the enemy within. See, what happens is the enemy attacks from without. If that doesn't work, the enemy will attack from within. And he'll start affecting our relationship with God, which again is the whole point of the whole thing, being rightly related to God. The New Testament calls that fellowship or koinonia. Cool word, I like that word. It's a Greek word, koinonia. It's this intimacy of relationship that we have with God. It, it's, it's allowable because of what Jesus did on the cross. I find it fascinating that the Bible points out that when Jesus died on the cross, one of the first things that happened 
was the veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies, which is where the Ark of the Covenant was, which was where the presence of God was. That veil was torn from top to bottom, indicating that it was about fellowship. The cross allowed relationship with God because our sins were, were forgiven. So now we see how to deal with those internal enemies. And that could be people that interfere with our relationship with God, our worship of God. But it also can relate to our struggle with the flesh. You know what I mean? If you don't know about this, you're probably not breathing. But the Bible talks about, if you're a Christian, that there's the struggle with the flesh. And the struggle is that we would continue to be rightly related to God because the flesh gets in the way of that. The flesh, when I say that, I, I'm meaning the self-life, a life that's lived by its, its own desires. Like, I do what I want to do. I'm all about me and my life and what I'm going to get and what I'm going to do in this life. That's the self-life. The cross came about to kill that self-life so that we can raise again like Jesus did and walk in the newness of life, a new life, a life led by God, directed by God, a life lived for God. So Nehemiah was a guy like that. He lived for God. And so he was, he was really focused on doing the things of God. That's what a person who's led by the Spirit does. They do God things, the things that God leads them to do. So Nehemiah now, as the leader, he has to stay focused on continuing the work. And that's, what we, that's their, the application for us. We have to stay focused on continuing the work. What work? God's work. That we would be about doing the things of God. That's the life of a Christian. So watch this in chapter 5. It says, And now there was a, a great outcry of the people and their wives against the Jewish brethren. So this is, uh, this is now the Jewish people now fractioned, separated, and fighting against each other. So this is how the enemy works. So in verse 2 it says, There were, there were those who said, we, our sons, our daughters, were many. Therefore, let us get grain that we may eat and live. So what was happening now is, as the Jewish people came back to Jerusalem, as the temple was built, now they're really struggling to take care of themselves, to make ends meet. Part of that was we see that there were many of them that came back. So there are more people than there were provisions for those people. So it's interesting because now we see how and where and when true character is really revealed. It's when things are tough. It's when your backs are up against the wall. It's when the pressure's on. That's that's what really brings out the true person we are. And so now there's a section of the Jewish people that were doing better than another group of the Jewish people. So you'll notice in verse 3, it says, There were also some who said, We have mortgaged our lands and our vineyards and our houses that we might buy grain because of the famine. So not only was there an influx of people which the provisions didn't provide for, but we also find to compound issues, there was a famine in the land. And so now there are some who are having to get way into debt to be able to just to feed their families. So in verse 4, there were also those who said, we have borrowed money for the king's tax, on our lands and our vineyards. So, to compound the matters even further, the taxes were such 
that they were having trouble paying their taxes. So in verse 5, Yet now our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren, our children, as their children, and indeed we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves, and some of our daughters have been brought into slavery. So one option, if you got so far into debt that you'd have to give a child up to somebody. The bad part about this, it was the other Jewish people who were also taken captive into Babylon and had come back to Jerusalem. Those were the ones who were imposing upon their fellow brothers and sisters these harsh demands to pay their bills. It was their own people. And so we see this heavy attack and we see there are certain people within the same community, people who should have been sympathetic, people who should have been compassionate and understanding, people who should have lend, uh, lent a hand, people who should have brought their brothers in and said, hey, I got your back, I'm going to take care of you, I'm going to help you. We, that's the key, we can do this. Instead, they were opportunists. And they saw an opportunity. An opportunity to gain from another person's misery and hardship. To take advantage. And this was something clearly set out in the Old Testament that they, the Jewish people were not allowed to charge interest to another Jewish person. They were not allowed to take advantage of another person, especially a, another Jewish person like that. So it says, It was not in our power to redeem them. For other men have our lands and our vineyards. Basically, we have, we have nothing. And not only that, we've now had to lend or give out our children to our own people. And you'll notice that term, it's key. If you notice that term, it says it's not in our power to redeem them. They're in a, in a place of complete and utter desperation. They needed help. It's an amazing picture of the Christian. One who comes to faith in Jesus Christ is one who realizes that it is not in our power, we have no ability to be with God, to change our circumstances spiritually. That, as Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, blessed are those who are poor in what? It's poor in spirit. You know what that means? Blessed are those who know and realize in and of themselves they are completely bankrupt spiritually. That as human beings we have zero ability to do anything about our sins. But Jesus was our Redeemer, wasn't He? See, the person who never comes to the place where they realize that spiritually, I am bankrupt, dead, empty, nothing, zero. And the kicker is, I can do nothing about that condition. I can't be good enough. A person with no money and no ability to get money can do nothing to buy their salvation, to do nothing to buy their land back, to buy their children back. And that's the beauty of salvation in Jesus Christ. That He redeemed us. That He saw our condition and He came and bought our salvation. He became our righteousness. He became our perfection. And that's why the Bible says it is by grace you are saved, not of works, lest any man boast. Meaning it's all of what God does and gives and nothing of what we do and earn. 
It's simply God has done it and we receive it. That's what grace is. So the understanding of this condition of complete and absolute need is the condition of the of the Jews. In verse 6, Nehemiah comes onto the scene and says he became very angry. Imagine, imagine Nehemiah, the, the leader of this troop, to rebuild the walls and reestablish this great community of believers and worshipers, and he finds he finds them taking advantage of one another. You know what was so disturbing for Nehemiah? Was because of their taking advantage of one another, it caused the real important issue of being about the vision and the plan and the purposes of God to be disturbed. Nehemiah was so about doing God's will that he got angry when God's will was being interrupted and when people would come and disrupt the working of God in the life of another person. So he is angry, but watch this wisdom. He says in verse 7, after serious thought, that is so important. You might want to highlight that. See, he was angry. He saw something that was wrong, but he didn't, here's the key word, react. He didn't react. He step, stepped away from the situation and he fought. The literal rendering of that word was that he reigned over his heart. That's how the, the Hebrew word is. He reigned. He had control over his emotions. He didn't fly off the handle. He didn't just go off. What he did was he was angry and he went to the Lord and he thought about the situation and he, he organized his feelings so that he can deal with the situation correctly and in the Lord because the Bible says that the anger of man doesn't produce the righteousness of God. Very, very, very important. And see, what's going on here is he is being challenged in his flesh, which had the potential for Nehemiah to do his will instead of God's will. That would cause him to be disoriented from his purpose of being rightly related to God. See, he had overarching his life that his life was going to be about being a worshiper of God. And now he's being threatened. That's being threatened. Here's the point for us, guys. First and foremost, we have to see our lives as Christians as worshipers of God. That has to be the way we see ourselves. The most important thing in our life is to be rightly related to God as worshipers. Him being God, us being able to come into fellowship with Him and live our life in subjection to Him. Give Him His due, His worth, Understanding that He is God, the Creator, the Alpha and the Omega, beginning and the end, the everything. So we come to God like that. And then we see these threats. A lot of them come in, in the form of people, in the form of circumstances, in the, the form of situations. And now we're tempted to react and to do our thing which threatens God's thing and it threatens our relationship with God. So that little statement is such huge wisdom. So he, he takes thought. And it says, Then I rebuked 
the nobles and the rulers. And I said to them, each of you is exacting usury. That means you're, you're just taking money from people when you should not be. So I called a great assembly against them. So now he's actually confronting the issue, but he's doing it with God directing him. Not in the flesh, not out of anger, not in a way that's going to harm the work of God. Have you ever noticed when somebody comes at you really intensely, your natural instinct is to do what? Snap back at them, right? That's why the Bible says a kind word turns back what? Wrath. It works too. A kind word turns back wrath. But when you get into somebody's face, their tendency is to get right back into your face. When you yell at somebody, it usually automatically makes them mad. Makes them angry. It's amazing how a situation can be diffused by a kind word. In our case, a rebuke was necessary, a challenge to what they were doing, but it was done in such a way where it gave the best opportunity for them to come to their senses and to do the right thing. So in verse 8, he says, And I said to them, According to our ability, we have redeemed our Jewish brethren who were sold to the nations. He's reminding them that these people have been re redeemed and now you're putting them back in the same position. He says, Now indeed, will you even sell your brethren? Are you crazy? Or should they be sold to us? Then they were silenced and they found nothing to say. Not sure exactly what silenced them, but sometimes just the truth is what sets people free. Sometimes just an explanation, helping a person see what they're doing in light of the truth is all that's needed. Who knows? Maybe they just didn't really pick up on how bad it was of a thing that they were doing. Maybe they just in some way have convinced themselves that they were okay doing what they were doing. Who knows? But it was Nehemiah's thoughtful, truthful confrontation that snapped them back into reality. Now we know that always that doesn't always happen like that. But we do find here that the need in instances to confront people with the truth. The way we do that is what's important. The way we handle things is important. And apparently Nehemiah handled it in such a way where they received it immediately. They were just speechless. They had nothing to say about what they were doing. And, and I like that about them. Because we can fault them for what they had done, but at the same time, we don't find them making excuses for themselves. Excuses be become habitual for an individual. When an individual begins to make excuses for themselves, what you'll find is that they, they don't know how to just come to the truth anymore. It becomes a habit, a lifestyle, where, where whenever confronted with something, they'll make an excuse about it. And what they're doing is they're trying to save face. They're, they're trying to, to hold on to, to some... some way of looking at themselves, but in reality they're harming themselves to the extent where they never come to the place of being truthful before God. That's why excuses are so bad. So much better to come to the place where, where we say, yeah, I'm wrong. It actually feels good to say, yeah, I totally blew it instead of 
carrying around excuse after excuse after excuse, which you find just builds and builds and builds. But just say, you know, I'm an idiot. I blew it. I admit it. I'm wrong. And boom, the forgiveness comes. The relief comes. You know what kind of pressure it is to carry around this facade of perfection that we can never let go of and we want everybody to think we're just so together and so awesome and we carry around this burden then we make excuses to hold on to that burden and a person can only handle that that for a certain amount of time eventually that person is going to implode from the inside once we come to the reality that we're not perfect. We're actually all pretty messed up. We're all, we're all in great need of the Lord. Once we come to that reality, it's pretty awesome. Because now we ourselves don't put these expectations on ourselves, which God doesn't put on us, which are completely unrealistic. We don't do that on ourselves. And then we don't let other people do that to us. Because we realize, but by the grace of God, it's only by the grace of God that I am what I am. But to come to that place is so magical. And they did that. They didn't make excuses. So in verse 9 it says, Then I said to them, What you are doing is not good. Should you not walk in the fear of our God because of the reproach of the nation, nations, our enemies? Do you see what he's saying there? He's saying, guys, do you not have any fear of the Lord? What a heavy statement, right? Guys, think about that. Because the Bible says that the fear of the Lord is what? It's the beginning of wisdom. See, until it, it comes back down to our orientation with God again. Until we're oriented to Him correctly. Understanding that He is God and He is holy and He is perfect. And that we are human. We're imperfect. imperfect we're weak. We're finite. We're limited. We need Him. And we fall on our faces before Him, dependent on Him, asking for mercy. Now we, we're getting it. But do you see that being in that right relationship means that we have this understanding of this great God, which at first, if we correctly understood who He was, do you, do you realize if God just showed up right now, we wouldn't be thinking that we, we have all this swag and we're all this amazing people who walk around so awesome, you know what we would do? We'd fall on our faces, trembling before God. Did you know that? Is that in the Bible? Have you seen, do you see guys when, when, when they see God, Jesus in His glorified body just all cocky and prideful and look at me, look how awesome I am? Do you think when we stand before God in all His glory that that's what it's going to be like? <laughs> no way. Are you kidding me? But isn't that what we can do today? We can. But Jesus says, and He told His disciples, they would freak out. Oh, they'd be all scared. And He'd, he'd tell them, don't be afraid. You can come. That's what He says to us. But it's our, our arrogance and our pride before a holy, almighty God which permits us to carry on in ways that are unfitting for a child of God. And He points out, Nehemiah points out, do you understand? Do you not have a fear of the Lord? I think this, this fear could be, be best understood as more of a, a child-to-parent relationship than it would be more of an employer-employee relationship. Meaning, every child instinctually, they want to please 
their parents. They should. That's the normal. You want, you want them to be proud of you. you. You want to please them. And that's the fear here. Is the fear is that they just want to please the Lord. You want to do what's right by Him. You want to live your life like that. That's what it's speaking of. And He's saying, what, is, what has happened to you? Have you just forgot God? Have you just cut them out of your mind so that you can do these, these things that are so ungodly? I think that's a great word here for us. But notice what he also says. He says, not, he says should you not, in verse 9, should you not walk in the fear of our God? But notice he says, because of the reproach of the nations, our enemies. Do you see the second? We're just going to finish on that. But listen to this. One, he's saying, what you're doing in your actions, you're able to do it, one, because you're incorrectly oriented with God. You're not walking in the fear of God. But two, have you forgot your purpose? Do you see that? He's saying, do you realize what you're doing? Those nations, your enemies around you, they're watching, they're seeing that. He's saying, do you realize that these enemies around you see this and they are getting the wrong impression about God? Do you know as a Christian it matters what we do? Do you know that? Do you know, and you might want to jot these scriptures down, in Romans 13.8, it says that we owe nothing to our fellow man except for a debt of love. We owe to our fellow man love. And then the second one is in Romans 14.21. Why don't we just turn there before we, we get into communion? Romans 14, 21. So, as we finish here, the point that Nehemiah is making if we, if we want to see it in a positive, if we want to see ourselves as Nehemiahs, here's what we're going to be seeing. We're going to, if we see ourselves as Nehemiah, Nehemiahs, we're going to be seeing ourselves as, as people that are so focused on the will of God that, that we've come to a place where, where we say, for me to live is Christ. Like, a Nehemiah is one who sees his life as one to be lived for God. Okay? If we're going to be a Nehemiah, that's what we have to see. And then as Nehemiahs, we see threats to that purpose. So the first thing we have to ask ourselves is, do we see our life on this planet as existing for God and to do His will? That's the first thing. If not... And it's really hard to even take a step forward in our Christian life. There is no step forward until that happens. Do you realize that? There's no step forward until we, we come to the realization that the purpose of, of, the purpose of our life is to live for God. So then the second thing is that now we live for God. What, what is important for us is that God does His thing through us. That He builds the walls. He builds His kingdom. He builds His life in and through our surrender to His will. Now as that happens, the things that threaten that are things that we don't want in our life. Why? Because we're not living for ourselves anymore. If we live for ourselves, that's when things get all tangled up. If we live for God's will, that's where everything is right. So that if that's being the case, then to live God's will is is to be loving our fellow man. We owe men the love of God. 
what that then means is that what we do is important because our life then is to be lived in such a way where it points to God. Now watch this. Romans 14.21 It says, It's neither... It's good neither to eat meat nor drink wine nor to do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or made weak. The whole chapter is about things that we can do, but should we do them? Do you see what he says there? If we we owe our fellow man... We owe them an example of God's love. How God works through our life. And part of that means now we have to be considerate of our actions and what they may say about God. Let me read that again. It is good neither to eat meat nor drink wine nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or made weak. So, we live our life in such a way where we're able to say, you know, it's more important to me that I don't stumble my brother or sister than it is for me to do whatever I want because I want to do it. And I can find proof texts in the Bible, I'm going to fight for my right to cause my brother to stumble. I'm going to prove to you where it says in the Bible that I have liberty to do all this stuff. Wait a second. You've been bought with a price. You're no longer your own. Are we really going to find all our fulfillment in doing our will? The bottom line is, and we're going to get into communion, is to to be a Nehemiah is to come to the place where we can, we can actually say and truly say, Lord, I'm surrendering my life to You now. Now my life is Yours. And we talked about this on Sunday, but you know the crazy thing about that? You and I will never begin to really live until we lose our selfish life. When we lose our selfish life, you know what the Bible says? That's when we begin to live. That's when we begin to become all that God has intended us to be. Let's be Nehemiahs. Surrendered to God's will and then living according to His purposes simply by allowing the Holy Spirit to live the life of Christ through us. Amen.